Let's, uh, could, could, could we just uh, show some appreciation one more time for the Abbotston Elementary School Choir? <laughs> I, I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, reopen the meeting. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McFadden. Second by Commissioner Roberts. All in favor? Bondima. Chinya Frank. McFadden. That is two, three, six yes, and three, four absent. Okay, I'm sorry. So at this time, I'm going to um, ask if, as you, if you're able, if you would please stand as we have uh, the presentation of colors by the JROTC at New Era Academy. Left turn, march. Color guard, halt. Present arms. Ma'am, New Era Academy Color Guard requests permission to post the colors. Permission granted. Thank you, ma'am. Order arms. Colors reverse. March. Color guard, hawk, present, arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order.
I want to uh, to uh, recognize our student performers and the JROTC for this evening. Uh, from New Era, we had Cadet Abdon Lopez, Cadet Lasante Perry, Cadet Fernando Woodson, Cadet Denisha Hill, and Cadet Nathaniel Parker. Um, our Abison Elementary School Choir under the direction of Miss Ariel Worschling, and I'm going to I'm going to apologize for any name that I don't do uh, correctly, but please know that I'm appreciating you, young people. Okay, <laughs> Dania Aha Klein, Candace Arnett, Joseph Brown, Kamari Curitan, Garland Fields, Tariq Good, Kevin Horsley, Keith Holman. Briaja Kenny, Sanaya James, London Jones, Ariana Mason, Michaela Wallex, Wallex, Darian Ward, Star Welcome, Dante Wheeler Jr., Beyonce Williams, Kenneth Bradford, Taliandria Chambers, Sophia Frink, Imoni Harold, Michaela Horton, Joshe Keats, Mashi Lee. Marcel Coleman, Janiah McDaniel, Lyric Nelson, Sherlyn Pace, Maya Smith, and Mackenzie Williams. Let's thank them one more time. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Frank uh, to lead us in a moment of silence. I would like to take this time to recognize the passing of several city school students and a member of the enrollment task force. Donnell Dixon, the Carver community is deeply saddened by the untimely passing of Donnell Dixon. Donnell passed away on October 29th, only 10 days after his 19th birthday. He will be surely missed by both his biological and Carver families. He was a member of the class of 2020. His trade was carpentry and his love for the class was undeniable. Donnell was vibrant, charismatic, lovable, and responsible. Although in stature, although small in stature, he was giant in heart. He did not allow a small physical frame to prescribe what he could do and not do. He was adventurous. He was bold. He was brave. He got along with his teachers, his administrators, and all the other students. It would be very hard to find any staff or student at Carver who had any ill feelings towards Donnell. Even when he was upset or frustrated, he always found ways to deal with his emotions. He reached out to staff members that he trusted to give him advice. He would smile softly, and he, as he would say, thank you, thank you for listening to me, a gentleman indeed. Abdullah Barber L. was a 17-year-old sophomore at Excel Academy at Francis M. Wood. He was quiet and respectful. He loved driving and spending time with his friends. Before joining the Excel Academy community in August of 2019, he had been a student at Frederick Douglass High School. Abdullah will be greatly missed by his family, friends, and the Excel Academy Devon Bradish, on October 27th, 2019, Devon Makiel Bradish, beloved member of the class of 2022, passed away. Devon had a warm, friendly, cheerful personality and was willing to help others and work, work, help others and work when everyone else um, had gone home. He was diligent and serious-minded about his academics and his activities alike. A humble servant leader who was devoted to his activities, friends, and family. Dr. Grigg, it is with deep regret that I inform you of the passing of Dr. Jeffrey A. Grigg, who, who passed away on November 10th. Dr. Grigg was born and raised in San Francisco. He went on to earn a bachelor's degree in English from Yale University, a master's degree in educational leadership and policy analysis from the University of Wisconsin, a second master's degree in sociology, and a PhD from, the, from sociology, sociology also from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Grigg was an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Education, where he was a researcher. He also held joint appointments at the Baltimore Educational Research Consortium and the National Science Foundation's Math Science Partnership STEM Achievement 
in Baltimore elementary schools. Dr. Grigg, his work brought him in contact with not only the school system, but also the city planning department, which used housing market trends to predict school enrollment. Dr. Grigg was also a member of the city schools enrollment task force in the public relations and marketing group. Dr. Grigg is survived by his wife, three daughters, and a host of family and friends. He will be greatly missed. Please take a moment of silence in memory of these students and Dr. Grigg. Thank you. I'm not gonna ask for a uh, motion to approve the prior open session minutes. Uh, Commissioner Bondim, is there a second? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Roberts. Oh, did I? Yes, all, of, all those in favor? Chinya. Okay. That's seven and three absent. Now I need a motion uh, to approve the closed session summaries. Commissioner Bondim, is there a second? Thank you, Commissioner Roberts. All those in favor? Frank. Hassan, Bondima, Chinya, McFadden, and Roberts. That is six. Okay. Uh, three absent and one abstention. One, six. Thank you. Uh, and I'm looking to be certain. All righty. Well, I had the pleasure of um, <laughs> of acknowledging one of our board members who has. Uh, who has ended her term on the board, and we were celebrating with her upstairs. I was looking to see if she was in the audience, but I'm going to, uh, I think we had a miscommunication and didn't tell her to, to, to come with us and stay, but we're gonna do it anyway, how's that? It's my great pleasure to recognize one of the true anchors of our board for the past four years. Dr. Muriel Berkeley has been a source of calm reflection and measured wisdom throughout a period of exciting change, as well as some turmoil at times. Since joining the board in 2015, Muriel could always be counted on to provide insight in the discussion of complex issues, perspective in the midst of controversy, and candor without rancor in the process of collegial debate. In recognition of her long and distinguished career as a teacher in the elementary, middle school, and college levels, <laughs> Muriel served for three years on the Teaching and Learning Committee, which she chaired during 2018-2019. She also spent two years on the Policy Committee and a year on the Strasburg Committee. Using her experience as founding president of the Baltimore Curriculum Project, which today operates five of our top charter schools in the district, she was a source of deep knowledge and open-minded fairness for the past two years on the Charter Advisory Committee. Muriel currently serves on the advisory board of OSI Baltimore, the Board of Trustees of the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and the Board of Trustees of the National Institute for Direct Instruction. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Social Relations at Radcliffe College, Harvard University, and a PhD in Social Relations at the Johns Hopkins University. I know that I'm speaking for everyone on the board when I say that we will miss Muriel's counsel in our deliberations because we could rely on her opinions with confidence in the knowledge that everything she said or did was motivated solely by her dedication to the schools, staff, and students of Baltimore City Public Schools. We offer Dr. Muriel Berkeley our sincere thanks for her service and our best wishes for her next mission on their behalf. Um, and in her absence, I just want to say thank you. And for Dr. Uh, Berkeley, we have certificates of recognition as well as a gift uh, from the board. So we'll just have another reason to get with her to celebrate so we can be certain that she gets these. But thank you. At this time, I'm going to... Uh,
call for is a, a presentation for Arts Every Day, instrumental music recommendations. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we may have a student joining us. Um, they were stuck in traffic on North Avenue the last time they texted. So hopefully, we'll have somebody else popping up here. But Chanel's going to get us started. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So glad to see your lovely faces today. I have been tasked with uh, the opportunity to give you an update regarding the Baltimore Arts Education um, Plan. So just to remind everybody about our overall goals, all pre-K through five students are enrolled in visual arts and music classes each year with dance and theater units taught in physical education and language arts. Am I supposed to be clicking? Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. I apologize. All students in grades K through eight will be enrolled in art classes and choose from two or more arts disciplines that will be in visual art, music, theater, or dance each year. And high school students will be able to choose from more than one discipline to meet the graduation requirement of one art credit. We are also committed to offering students depth of study within two or more arts disciplines. And so we'll get into that just a little bit later. And also, if I can circle back just for a little bit, um, our goals for our 2022 goals is that 100% uh, of our schools will be staffed with um, music and visual arts educators. <coughs> As of 2018-19, roughly 86% of our schools offer visual art, 68% of schools offer music, 13% of schools offer theater, and 10% of our schools offer dance. We have a long way to go in achieving access to both art and music across all, all of our schools, but we do believe progress has been made in this area and that we will be able to see some more progress once the 1920 data analysis is complete. So I'll give you about 10 seconds just to kind of look at that to see. We began implementation of the arts plan through new pre-K through eight budget guidance, setting a student to teacher ratio. And this is um, an example of what we're doing, of what is being doing, is, sorry, of what is being done statewide. So what we were able to do was take a look at what other LEAs were offering in terms of arts programming, and we were able to make this, um, so we were able to scale it so that it would be something that Baltimore City Schools would be able to achieve so when creating new FTE schools prioritized according to visual art and music before other fine arts content areas. And we did that strategically because as in the past slide I shared with you, it was much easier to staff to 100% when you're starting from about 86 as opposed to starting at five. We are looking to achieve a balance of rigorous arts instruction taught by certified arts teachers, supported and enhanced by the many artists, museums, and organizations that partner with our schools. As a result of this budget guidance, and I just want to say I am tremendously proud of what we have been able to accomplish in such a small amount of time, seems like. I just started in 2016-ish in this position, so the amount of progress that we have been able to make with our partners has been tremendous, and I really do appreciate the support that we've had from our board members and our CEO to help us get there. So this is where we are, um, uh, the earliest data point that we could confirm from HC is school year 2012-2013, um, so you can see how we took a dip, but the story does not stop at 174, where we had our lowest amount of certified arts teachers teaching in the district, we've been um, on the uprise. We've been inclining, so we're pretty proud of that. We are still waiting on a comprehensive school year um, 
1920 data to confirm the number of new fine arts classrooms across the district. This is just a sneak peek of how the budget guidance has impacted the district overall. As you can see, visual art in school year 1819, we had 113 certified teachers. This year, we were able to onboard 10, bringing our number to 123. Music, there were 82. We onboarded 11, which brought our numbers up to 93. In theater, we had six. Now we have 11. And then in dance, we had three, and now we have five. So in some cases, you know, people might look at this data and, and say, well, you know, that's marginal increase. But for us, these are huge strides because it shows as a district the commitment that we have to our kids and making sure that we're touching those wholeness points. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Julia DeBuslo. I'm the executive director of Arts Every Day. Um, and we serve as the backbone organization to the Baltimore Arts Education Initiative um, and the mission of trying to ex improve equity and access to the arts district-wide. Um, as part of that role, we've been uh, working to rise, raise pri private funding to be able to support um, the implementation of the arts plan, which has included a $30,000 challenge fund to support materials funding a professional learning community for brand new arts teachers um, and first through third year arts teachers, and a professional development session for physical education teachers to begin uh, and to improve their implementation of an existing dance unit within the phys ed curriculum. That aligns to the arts plan, um, so we're really excited to, seeing, uh, to see movement on that front. <clears throat> The arts plan was collaboratively written uh, between community arts partners, um, educators, district leaders, and city leaders. And implementation has continued in that vein with an advisory committee chaired by uh, Chief Davis, an instrumental working group uh, that has met over the course of the fall. And we will be convening a high school working group in uh, early January 2020. <clears throat> Our recommendations for 2021 and beyond are to continue to expand the District Fine Arts Office capacity. Uh, Dr. Sanalisis, we want to thank you for your pledge to expand the office by one staff member. And we look forward to um, really seeing that happen. I think that will just dramatically improve the capacity to be able to support not just the brand new arts teachers that are in the system for the first time this year, but so many of those veteran arts teachers that um, have been serving our students every day. We are overjoyed to see the gains in pre-K through arts, uh, pre-K through eight, eight uh, grades access, but we acknowledge that high school is going to be a tougher road to haul for several reasons, <coughs> including um, budgets, enrollment sizes, and um, scheduling issues. So uh, that is the reason for the working group, and we'll be back with those recommendations. Please also know that Arts Every Day remains a committed advocate for the full funding of Kerwin, um, and we are hoping to see the entire pie get larger. Next. So I'll wrap up with um, some instrumental music uh, working group recommendations. And I just want to note that in every other surrounding county, not only do they have visual art and music as a standard across every single school, the majority of schools in all of the other counties have instrumental music in uh, starting in grades four and five. Um, now you'll see that in our recommendations, we have that instruction starting in grades six, seven, and eight. Um, that is intentional because that, you know, we have to start somewhere, right? Um, we have less, uh, about 15% of schools that have in instrumental music right now that are taught by a certified arts teacher. Um, so we have a long way to go. Um, so by targeting grades six, seven, and eight, we feel that um, students are still going to be able to become proficient in their instrument of choice and become active members of their band um, if they start in those middle grades. 
you'll see that there's a handout with some more in-depth uh, recommendations. This is a one-pager that is a part of a much longer document that um, we are working on uh, collaboratively with Chanel's office and the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, so I'll just highlight a few, uh, a, a few top-level points. One is to establish clear guidelines and procedures for instrument maintenance um, and uh, tracking across the district, making sure that that's done um, and can be found time after time. This will help um, us raise funds that are external to the district and be able to bring in more corporate support to be able to support the expansion of instrumental music. The second is to clarify and implement consistent use of um, instrumental music course codes. It was very difficult to look through course data because the use of the course codes has, is a little spotty. Sometimes they're, tar they're um, classified under general music. Sometimes they're classified under instrumental music. So there's some work there that is zero dollars that will help in the reporting over time. Lastly, um, if there is um, the opportunity to expand in instrumental music, we hope that the district does prioritize this. We know that we're in a very pre-Kerwin landscape and that there are a lot of unanswered questions about what funding will look like this year. So I just want to acknowledge that off the bat. Um, I know that you guys are working as hard as you can to make sure that there are extra dollars brought in. Um, but we do hope that instrumental music is a priority. Um, we suggest working on a cohort-based model uh, with three to six high sc uh, middle schools starting um, and uh, hopefully prioritizing some of those 21st century schools. They have some really beautiful performing arts spaces. We would love to see those spaces utilized with really great instruction. <clears throat> Um, so once again, I thank you for our time tonight. We have one last um, presenter, and that's one of Baltimore City Public Schools' fantastic shining leaders in instrumental music, Ms. Skyla Ross. Um, hi, my name is Skyla Ross. I'm a senior at Western High School. Um, I've been in their band program all four years, and I haven't had the chance to learn music when I was in elementary or middle school. So it was a little more challenging to catch up with people who did have that experience. Um, I feel as though it's really critical for band to be implemented into these like more youthful stages of life because just insecurities that come with not knowing as much as the people around you or not being able to do what they can do, that puts a toll onto you and that adds on more stress and you feel as if you can't do what you have to do. Um, being in band, it's a really great experience. You know, it's something that everybody should be given the opportunity to have to go through and it's just another path of life that people can choose than going through the more common routes of like football or basketball or rapping or dancing or nursing or anything like that. You know, it's just another option for us and that's really important to have because it gets really it gets really tiresome to have everyone trying to do the same thing you know being in band it's just something different something new something that's not as original as everything else that we do yeah thank you so much and I also just want to acknowledge that Abbotston Elementary did a really great job of showing what's, what's possible when we really invest in fantastically strong teachers. Um, and those students were also doing some of the work around learning the recorder, and that's a great gateway instrument into full instrumental music. So thank you again for having us here tonight, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Are there any? I know. I know. Commissioner McFadden is grabbing that microphone. <laughs> Scarlett, I don't know if you know, but I've been following you since the spring concert um, last year, and I, I do want to just say um, and just comment on how talented you are. 
um, not just as a, a percussionist. You're a percussionist? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm right. See, I told you I've been following you. <laughs> but also um, your ability to compose music. You are a fabulous composer and arranger, and I've heard several of um, your compositions that your band has played, and I think Miss Williams is here. I saw her come in. Is she here, your band director, your band teacher? Yes. Yeah. Can you stand so that we can all acknowledge the wonderful work that you're doing at Western? She also happens to be a Morganite. It, I just might add that too, Ms. Williams. But I just want to just celebrate you, um, and hopefully you pursue um, music as, a, as an option um, for your career. Um, and just know that you have a supporter here on the board, but in Baltimore, if you ever need anything, any advice, any audition, any of that, um, Ms. Williams certainly knows how to reach me and get in touch with me. I do want to just thank you all for the presentation. Um, and I know that, Julia, you mentioned Kerwin and the importance of it being fully funded. Um, and right now, we are not adequately, adequately funded um, as a school system. So can someone talk a little bit about um, why our arts programming here in Baltimore City is not up to the standard that it should be in comparison to other school systems and their ability to offer instrumental music um, at fourth grade um, and, and the option of, of diverse arts programming at the middle school level. Can we talk a little bit about that, Ms. Howard? Certainly. And um, not to sound cliche at all, but um, it's money. It's a money issue. We don't have, there's not a lack of desire in terms of what we want to do. But um, at the end of the day, we don't have the money to be able to do that. Additionally, Baltimore City um, is one of the last standing in terms of decentralized funding. So it makes it a little bit difficult in terms of how we are able to say that this is what schools have. And I don't, there's not too much more um, as opposed to that, but I think that uh, one of the reasons why we're pushing so hard for Kerwin is because that's money that, and that let, let's say Kerwin in terms of, um, so that school systems can use the money for what we determined that is important to us. Because Kerwin, as they are releasing funding and as the state is releasing funding for other things, they come with strings attached. So it's hard to say in Baltimore City that this is something that we want to do that we find that is important, that all of our, all of our children deserve, when we can't necessarily fund it properly the way that it should be. So until we are able to have um, adequate funding, like some of our other uh, areas and school systems in the state, until we are able to do that, this will always be a conversation that we'll have. And so part of my position as a fine arts coordinator is to think in terms of if we never get another dollar, how can we be creative with the money that we have in the structures that we already have existing? But how many of our other LEAs have to think like that? And so until we are able to kind of rectify that, and I'm saying we as a body, not just as Baltimore City Public Schools, but as we as a, as a people are able to rectify that in terms of our children, this is where we are. I just want to thank you for saying that, but I just want to add, I think this, this is also a time for us, as, I mean, not only just the funding, but just the whole issue of priority and choice. Because I believe, um, I, Dr. Tantalisa and I are here having a side conversation, but a part of this is also the choice that we make at the level of the school. And so I would also encourage school-based uh, teams um, to, to just realize the importance of having the arts. Those are the, that is the way that we use uh, the lessons that we learn in English and math and science. And so to the extent that we, we stop having to, to, to make choices between whether we're going to do this or that, but, but really uh, decide that a well-rounded, fully well-rounded, comprehensive uh, experience is what all of our students need. Uh, then we can applaud more than just, you know, the Thanksgiving Day Parade when we saw our fabulous folks from Oregon uh, performing, but we should be seeing that much more often. Absolutely. The other piece is that I do think that it is part, I would um, just add to what Commissioner Chinia said that I think the board needs to consider. <clears throat> um, this is also... Um, an unintended consequence 
um, of that school choice over a period of time. Um, because, you know, full disclosure, I remember being chief academic officer and having instruments jettisoned because a new leader decided they didn't want a music program anymore. And, ha and I know it's the case because I was here and got calls about there's a room full of instruments. Somebody come and pick them up because we decided we're going to do a different art this year. So I think we need to own all aspects of what contributed. Part of why it is so expensive to rebuild a program is because we wavered from the deliberateness of saying what should be choice and what should not. And I have conversations with school leaders all the time who say, well, you know, we feel like some of our autonomy is being taken away. Well, when we gave autonomy, autonomy meant in some cases clarinets being put in a box. And somebody called to come and take them away. And so I think that the larger conversation we need to have from a policy perspective is what, what are the bench line, you know, what are the baseline? That there are some things that when we talk about options and autonomy, right, that when it supersedes what we know young people should have the option for, right? I only played the flute for four years. I got my flute in fourth grade in my public elementary school. The little notes got too much for me, Commissioner McFadden. And so by the end of sixth grade, I decided I don't want to play the flute anymore. But I had the option. And it wasn't somebody coming in with no input. And like I said, so I, th I think we need to own that, that it is funding. But we allowed, as a district, through our policy, the decimation of some of our elementary and middle school programming. And so one of the things I would ask you all to do is we should set up some time so that we can review what the path back looks like what is our inventory of instruments look like? I mean, it, it broke my heart. Because I remember my sister had one of my niece's old flutes and an old sac saxophone from my nephew that she said, do you want us to donate to city schools? And I remember at the time saying, no, please don't donate it, because I don't know where it would go. <clears throat> That's on us. That's not on Kerwin. And so we have to be able, as a community, to ask ourselves the tough questions. And I'm saying this because, again, as we have discussions about autonomy and who wants to do what, when autonomy now encroaches on a young person being able to discover for the, him or herself whether they want to play flute or not. I got to decide. But Skylar didn't get to decide. And so, yeah, I just want us to be honest when we have this discussion. That, that it's a both and. It is more funding for music, but it is also sticking with a trajectory over a period of time. So I would like to see as follow-up the instrumental music plan that includes where are we in our instruments, which instruments do we prioritize. I remember calling people and begging them to come take cellos. We, we had to give cellos away to an outside organization. Now, maybe I shouldn't be airing this publicly, but I'm just letting everybody know. We, we've got we to get, we got to be honest and straight so that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I do want to celebrate you also for the work that yes. you have been doing. Amazing. Like you said, you know, with what you have to work with, you've been quite innovative in making sure. And also the professional learning plan that you've, um, initiated particularly for new teachers. I'm glad that you sent that because gave me an opportunity to celebrate you on an opportunity like tonight. So I just want to say thank you for the work that you are doing right now in an office of one, right? But hopefully we'll, we'll get some more support in that area too as we move along. So thank you all and thank you, Julia. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I would love to uh, be making a report about donations, but um, tonight we do not have uh, donations to report at this time, so this is just an invitation to anyone who would 
uh, like to, uh, after hearing our last conversation, um, would like to uh, make a donation to the Baltimore City Public Schools, please do. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the, the personnel and quasi-judicial matters. Okay, Commissioner Hassan, second it. Commissioner Frank, um, all those in favor? Chinya. Okay. Six. Three absent. And I believe uh, with that, I am ready to turn it over to <laughs> Dr. Santalisis. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Sorry if y'all can't understand. If y'all, I'm sure you, I'm still processing all those instruments with Commissioner McFadden. Anyway. Good to see everybody here this evening. Good to be here. Um, I want to invite Chief Grant Skinner uh, for this e evening's PEP agenda. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Santelices. Uh, most of our appointees are here this evening, so I would invite you to stand and be recognized as I call your name. Uh, first, Catherine Califoot, uh, IEP team associate from Furman Templeton Preparatory Academy, is appointed Educational Specialist 2 for due process, effective January 21st. Uh, Kateva Burton, Educational Specialist in Henrico County Public Schools, is appointed Coordinator of Student Wholeness, effective January 6th. Milton Garns, Educational Associate for Non-Public Placement Services, is appointed Educational Specialist to Suspension Services, effective January 6th. <laughs> Ashley Ventura, Elementary Teacher at Abbotson Elementary School, is appointed Assistant Principal at Abbotson Elementary, effective December 11th. <laughs> Dan Oliver, Educational Specialist to for Mathematics Education is appointed Academic Content Liaison for Mathematics, effective December 11th. <laughs> Jeffrey Covington, uh, elementary teacher at Angela Y. Davis Academy, is appointed Assistant Principal at National Academy Foundation, effective December 11th. Uh, Andre Riley, Director of Strategic Communications and Marketing in DeKalb County School District, was uh, appointed Director of Communications effective November 25th. <laughs> and finally, Rosalind Fleming, Assistant Principal at Lily Mae Carroll Jackson School, is appointed Interim Principal at Lily Mae Carroll Jackson uh, de December 11th through June 30th. Thank you, Chief Grant Skinner. Um, as has become our practice, I would like to read just a little bit more um, about Interim Principal Fleming. Uh, Rosalind Fleming has been a member of City Schools since 2010 in various roles, providing high-quality instruction and supporting teachers. Her roles have included teacher, project-based learning coach, teacher mentor, new teacher onboarding facilitator, and literacy coach. In 2016, Ms. Fleming joined the uh, city school's aspiring principal program, supported by new leaders, and served as a principal resident at Lily Mae Carroll Jackson Charter School. She then became Lily Mae Carroll Jackson's assistant principal, as we just heard, and so we are now very pleased that she will be serving as interim principal. Congratulations. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to express my uh, sincere appreciation to the Baltimore Ravens organization uh, and players for their continued support for city schools. Last Monday, for the second year in a row, the Ravens Players Social Justice Fund donated $200,000 to accelerate our program to install vertical package units in schools without air conditioning or adequate heating. They're doing this to ensure that our staff and students enjoy a safe, comfortable learning environment throughout the year. The Ravens are truly 
Baltimore's home team, and we are deeply grateful for everything that they have done and they continue to do on behalf of our city's schools and students. They are truly, um, yes, a, an organization of excellence, but also an organization with heart. So we want to thank the Baltimore Ravens yet again. Um, as part of um, the state's accountability process, the Maryland State Department of Education issues an annual report card for nearly every school in the state. New this year, and keep in mind this is only the second year of this report card, uh, the Maryland School Survey measure is a component of this school quality and student success uh, indicator portion of this report card. You should know that students in grades 5 through 11, as well as educators, take the survey in the spring. We will have an in-depth presentation on this year's results in January, but I have asked Chief Achievement and Accountability Officer uh, Teresa Jones and her team to just give us a brief top-line presentation this evening. So I would uh, ask uh, Chief Jones uh, forward at this time. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Teresa Jones, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Achievement and Accountability Officer here at City Schools. Uh, for tonight's top line presentation, I'm going to start with a little brief background about the report card. Um, I think most folks are aware that the Every Student Succeeds Act was signed in the federal law in 2015. And as a part of that, there was a state requirement that all states create their plans that would then um, include as a part of that a public reporting around how schools are doing in alignment with a new form of accountability. So every state took upon the task of creating its own accountability framework in the state of Maryland. That was an extensive process that involved stakeholder engagement from around the state as well as benchmarking what's happening in other places. As a result of that, we do have a report card that is made publicly available at the web address that you see listed there. Um, I know most folks um, do recall last year um, how this was starting to play out, um, knowing that the vision was not fully realized in its first year of implementation um, due to the inability to have all of the indicators available. Um, so this is a continuation in year two to now see what does it look like in a more expansive format. Um, so we're going to top line the results and then make reference to where you can get more information. As, a re as we look at year two, there are a couple key things that we did want to highlight. First and foremost, as Dr. Santelis has mentioned, the inclusion of a survey um, is an important new component. Um, in this case, we have student and educator responses that have been included in this year's calculation of report card ratings. We also have the inclusion of the science assessment. Um, that's the MISA, or the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, in grades 5 and 8. And then this year, because it is the second year, there's also a section on the report card where there's an indicator improvement flag um, that indicates whether or not a particular indicator has increased in its performance versus the prior year. As it relates to the format of the accountability framework, um, what you see listed here are the set of indicators that are used to determine what the report card ratings are. So what you see here is, is the combination of indicators across all grade bands, elementary, middle, and there are some that are unique to high school um, that are noted there. For example, the readiness for post-secondary success. As it relates to the determination of the ratings, um, there's data collected um, across a variety of measures, and those are then brought into um, a calculation that leads to a total number of points available. Um, and then as a, a percentage of the points available, there is a determination of what the actual rating is. So it is a five-star rating system, so the lowest rating being a one-star. Basically, um, as you see listed here, if the total uh, percentage of earned points is somewhere between zero to 29 percent, that school would be assigned a one-star rating, and then you can see from there the scale from one to five. As we look at year two, we have compared our district's results versus last year. Um, what you'll see listed here is the distribution showing that last year, um, as a district, the majority of our schools were in the two and three star categories. Um, we had the largest percentage of one star schools versus the other local school systems in the state. Um, and you'll see that noted there at that 13.3%. And we had three five star schools um, in that first year. 
As we take a look at year two, um, we continue to have a large percentage of schools in the two and three star area. Um, and while there is a reduction in the number of five star schools, there is also a reduction in the number of one star schools. And as it relates to the one star schools, um, one of the key reasons that you see that 10 school decrease is because there were some schools that were closed as a part of our annual portfolio review process. And there were a number of schools that actually increased their ratings versus last year, as you'll see momentarily. Looking at the rating changes versus last year, the majority of our schools um, held steady um, with no change. That's the 92 that you see in the middle. And then we were about evenly split um, in terms of schools that either increased um, by a star versus decreasing by a star. Um, there is one notation here for a Calvin Rodwell um, because they were the one school that experienced a two-star rating decrease. Um, that was partly attributable to, attributable to the fact that they actually included the middle grades as a part of the um, adjustments um, as schools have shifted. As we take a look at our district's performance relative to the state and several of the other local school systems, um, again, you'll see our distribution listed at the very top, and then you'll see the statewide distribution at the bottom. Um, if you've been following the reporting around the results this year, um, one of the key takeaways is that the majority of schools in the state of Maryland have sort of trended more towards the middle. Um, and so there have been decreases on either end of the spectrum, both in terms of the one-star and five-star ratings. Um, that in part is um, attributable to the fact that the survey results have been included this year. Um, you'll also see noted as you compare Baltimore City to um, some of the other school systems, um, a large number of the other school systems also have a good number of their schools in those middle rating categories. Um, however, Anne Arundel um, was a district that did see um, significant increases in their four star um, and five star ratings versus prior year. And then what you'll also see is one of our key uh, peer districts, which is Prince George's County also was sort of similar to us in sort of that trending towards the middle. As it relates to the school survey, um, we are still in the process of analyzing the results and we'll come back with more information at a later time. Um, but we did want to just summarize briefly that there were four domains that were measured as, as a result of this year's survey. Um, keep in mind, this is the first year, so it is a baseline data collection for all districts across the state. Um, the data was collected across these four domains. Um, and then in addition to that, on the educator survey, there, were also, there was also a question that had to do with the quality of instructional free feedback. Uh, really briefly, key takeaways from the survey, thinking about those different areas. Um, generally speaking, our elementary school students gave more positive responses than the middle or high school students. Some of the key areas to note were in the areas of student-staff relationships, behavior and academics, as well as in substance abuse. Um, generally speaking, educator responses were largely positive and higher than what we saw in the student responses. Um, key areas to note there were in the areas of student-staff relationships, again, behavioral and academic supports, and in the areas of bullying. Excuse me, bullying. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, we are still in the process of analyzing the results, um, and we'll come back with more information um, in January. At this time, um, that sort of concludes the top line view of the survey, um, certainly, excuse me, of the report card ratings. If there are additional questions, um, please feel free to let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Jones. <coughs> Um, as part of our focus on equity, we have uh, make, made great strides over um, the last uh, three to four years to really expand our advanced academics, um, gifted and advanced learning opportunities to every zip code throughout the city rather than just those kind of traditionally assumed to have gifted students. And that expansion has also been accompanied with some really thoughtful work um, about the quality of learning experiences uh, for all young people throughout the city. Um, each year, the National Association for Gifted Children, Javits Fraser Scholars Program, recognizes passionate, innovative educators who work in districts that serve large numbers of students from low income um, and uh, student of color populations, uh, both of whom are historically underrepresented in gifted education. Last year, two city schools teachers were selected as Javits Fraser Scholars, and I am very pleased to announce that this year, 
Ms. Ife Payne was chosen for this honor in recognition of her advocacy for students at Belmont Elementary, which received the Excellence in Gifted and Talented Award conferred by the state last spring. I should point out that Ife was one of only 10 teachers selected nationally for this award, which truly is a remarkable achievement. I would now like to invite Ife to come forward and be recognized as this year's Javits Frazier Scholar for City Schools. Congratulations, Ife. Now with regards to uh, grading policy, uh, we have heard from many of you, and by you I mean we've heard from parents, and I have, I think to the benefit of the district and myself, heard from a large number of students, young people um, across the city. Uh, we adopted um, the, about the change in grading policy. Uh, we adopted the change in the grading policy really because we believe grades should be actually a helpful tool uh, for families and young people in gauging where, <coughs> excuse me, their performance, where uh, their learning is. We conducted a large number of engagement sessions um, where it was clear from families that many of you wanted to know whether your students' grades um, actually reflected the learning uh, that, that was occurring, the true learning. This revised policy really was a move uh, to, more, um, to, to be more transparent, particularly in that vein. Now, while we engaged many families in the grading development process, we made the final changes uh, to the grading policy without clear and thorough discussions with students about the changes that were coming and why we were making these changes. In too many cases, students were not properly prepared to understand the changes in our grading policy and did not receive the supports they deserve from their schools that would have enabled them to navigate this period of change. Uh, we own this wrinkle both with regards to our central support of schools and then in turn school support of young people. Um, the preparation and, uh, and those supports actually should have been our primary focus. And when I met with young people, what was very clear was when the time was taken to understand the actual purpose of the shift in the grading, loud and clear what I know I heard was a need for greater support in them actually making that shift. We sent a letter to the city schools community earlier this month expressing our heartfelt apology to all stakeholders and especially to families and students. I have committed the district to making a much deeper dive into how we can better inform and support our students throughout this process. We reviewed the key components of the policy with principals at our district-wide principals meeting last Thursday and offered training sessions led by exemplary schools. In addition, we are running an analysis on the impact of the new policy on grades, which will be completed next week. Moving forward, here is what you can expect. In December, Students will receive in-depth presentations about the grading policy in their schools. And parents and guardians will receive an additional communication from the district regarding the policy, highlighting the rights of students and families related to the grading policy. 
We are also creating additional professional learning for teachers around grading practices. And in the spring, we will have a series of forums to share students' and families' rights under the new grading policy. Throughout this process, we will continue to solicit feedback from students and parents as we work to improve implementation. One thing was clear to me throughout, and that is 99% of the young people I heard from were not backing away from the high levels of expectation. They were not backing away from the need to do well. They were simply calling for a greater level of support and orientation to what the new process was. And I want to thank the young people who very courageously, in meetings, community meetings, separate meetings of students groups with me, very forthrightly made their case even here at a board meeting. And for me, it was a wonderful example of how young people can contribute and help us course correct when need be. And actually, it signals the extent to which we really do need to be consulting young people as we roll out um, new policies, particularly with the intent. So I want to thank all of the young people I heard from, including our own Commissioner Lynn, who I think did a fabulous job um, in, in mobilizing. And I want to say that actually um, the meetings I had with young people, some were a little tense in the, some of the community meetings. But I just have to say, uh, the series of meetings overall I had with young people, perhaps I shouldn't say this, actually rivaled large percentages of meetings I have with adults who come far less prepared, do not have the background and the evidence to back up their passion, and who simultaneously, what was so impressive was your simultaneous advocacy coupled with your ownership for your performance. And I think we as adults owe you the support that matches the level of your advocacy, your determination, and your focus. So I want to thank not only Commissioner Lynn, but all of the young people um, who really did, um, did us all a great service in flagging this and the way that you did it. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> final two things. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of some inclement weather tomorrow morning. And whenever that's the case in point, whenever that's the case, please make sure to check City Schools Twitter, Facebook, or district website before leaving for school for any announcements. Of course, we will continue to make announcements uh, through local news media. This has always been the case. While we strive to keep our students in school and learning as much as possible, our primary goal is always the safety of our staff and students. Um, at a later date, we will um, share some of the data of the excellent work that our principals, school leaders, and our operations team. Um, so I'm, I'm just looking at um, at Acting Chief Land, uh, for, uh, who is serving um, now in the capacity of Chief Operating Officer, while Dr. Washington, who had a beautiful baby boy, um, is still home enjoying her maternity leave. And I will say that even in the midst of that, um, we are very pleased with um, the small, I think we had one closing uh, last year for heating in particular. We significantly reduced um, the number of schools that needed to be closed um, for air conditioning uh, late summer. Um, and a lot of that is due to the very hard work of our school leaders and the operations team, the revamping. Um, and so we will continue to maintain um, our threshold for temperatures. We will continue to do two temperature checks um, in the morning. And when at all possible, when we know that we cannot alleviate the temperature challenge, uh, we will call school as early as we possibly can. I know that will never be early enough in every case for every family. Um, I know that that is the case, but just know that our intent really um, is to make sure you know as soon as possible. And then finally, um, part of why I lost my voice um, 
is due to a post-Thanksgiving uh, cold. But the other reason uh, that I lost my voice is because I had the absolute privilege of cheering um, our own Dunbar poets for making it to the state championship game um, against Catoctin High School in Division 1A last Saturday. I was there. Um, with my daughter, we were daughters, we were cheering um, on Dunbar. It was nice because it was it just to show the power of city schools to bring people together. You had um, folks in the stands who were Steelers fans and Ravens fans, and I was a Patriots fan. But it did not matter. There you go. Um, because we were all cheering on Dunbar. The poets um, were, were on the verge of making literally state football history. Um, and they came up a little bit short this time. But I just want you to know what impressed me as I walked on the sidelines was the resilience of our players. I heard some of the stories of young people um, who really, for them, football and the values of football, um, the character development with the coaches, that is really what, frankly, I left just as happy. Um, they weren't just as happy in not winning um, as I was. But it was just a sight to behold our scholar athletes and the entire Dunbar community um, coming out. And so I want to really congratulate the poets and Coach Lawrence Smith just for an amazing season and uh, just wonderful work with our young people. So congratulations. And that concludes my remarks for this evening. <clears throat> Thank you. Cheers uh, to Dunbar for a great season. Yeah. We have um, an information. Oh, just really quick, just one point of clarification. Okay, please. Um, the school report card follow up will be at the January 7th Teaching and Learning Committee, not the 14th meeting, just for people who aren't expecting it. So that'll okay, be 3 30, Tuesday, 3 30 at January, on January 7th. Okay. Thank you. Just a, a week earlier, right? Okay. Good. Uh, we have uh, an information and discussion item, and that is the first reader for policy JLF, Child Abuse and Neglect. Good evening, James Torrance, Staff Specialist for Strategy and Compliance in the Office of Academics. Good evening, Deborah Brooks, Executive Director of Special Education in the school's office. Good evening, Jerome Jones, Director of Labor Relations and Office of Human Capital. Tonight we're presenting Board Policy JLF, Child Abuse and Neglect for his first reader. Just to give you background, this current policy details our reporting requirements for staff when they suspect child abuse and neglect, and also the compliances with state and local laws. Um, our offices of related, ser related services and labor relations reviewed the policy for to make technical amendments. So state board um, requires employees uh, to report uh, and service providers who have reason to suspect that a child has been uh, subjected to abuse or neglect on or off school grounds shall report such abuse uh, to uh, Child Protective Services. Uh, and it states that any individual who makes a good faith report of su suspected abuse or neglect shall, shall be immune from any civil liability or criminal um, uh, penalty. Uh, what we did in revising the policy uh, is to delineate, um, because we have reports from both parents and guardians and employees, we try to uh, delineate between the two uh, so that our administrators uh, can know that it is a responsibility to gather as much information uh, when it is an employee, which will then help with child, child Protective Services and also our internal staff investigations to uh, get to the bottom of these uh, allegations. And then it specifies that all records and reports concerning abuse 
or neglect and the information contained in them are confidential. The administrative regulation currently uh, details the reporting requirements for all staff and employees, as well as provides a detailed training for our employees, service providers, and our staff, school-based staff. And so each year, the training provided for our service providers uh, is, takes place during the first systemic PD so that all service providers are provided the training. And then school-based staff is provided prior to the winter break. All documentation for sign-in sheets for those that have provided this training as well as the agenda are turned in so that it is, we are accountable for those staff that have been trained as well as all training material is aligned with COMAR regulations. Also procedures that are followed are um, when students are questioned on school grounds by appropriate authorities are outlined in the current regulations as well as parental notifications in the parameters. Um, the current definition of employees was expanded to include our temporary employees as well as persons who are certified and not certified and as well as members of the board. Um, we've received feedback from the um, Charter Advisory Council to add operators as well to add that onus of the reporting. So we're going to revise that for our second reader as well. Um, it also specified that any second employee or service provider who suspects that means that if a student or someone else has firsthand knowledge and they relay that, relay that knowledge to you, you're required to report as well. It may not be the most substantial, but it does add more information to the investigation for the Department of Social Services. Um, we also have updated about the contact information since things have changed since implementing the policy before. So mailing addresses as well as contact numbers have changed for these related services. Um, also specifies copies be given to our staff investigations unit, um, basically aligning with our current process. And then clarifies the role of principals in gathering additional information. And we say investigating parties because that can come from staff investigations, the state's attorney's office, or, or um, law enforcement as well. Also, again, some of the changes since the policy committee, we've expanded the procedures when we're uh, talking about individuals that have reason to suspect uh, to, uh, any type of child abuse um, to include, again, the employee or service provider. Uh, also, um, we also prohibit the details of the allegations and the contents of the oral written report from being shared with the alleged um, per perpetrator. Also, we specify the school administrator is responsible for gathering the additional information um, to make the informed report. Also, language was added to definitions for abuse, mental injuries, and sexual abuse. And this is our engagement so thus far. Any questions? All right, thank you. This was the first reader, uh, and I think you have the slide if there any additional questions or comments with your um, email and things are listed there. So thank you. Okay, at this time I'm just going to be doing a um, review of the consent agenda. We are not voting at this time. We do this prior, right before public comment um, so that um, if there are any issues that come up, the uh, uh, the board may consider those. So uh, again, I'm just reading them uh, for the board to let me know whether they wish to have them remain on the consent agenda or to have them pulled. Okay, so the first item is 8.01, the board legislative platform. 8.02 waiver requests for charter lottery preferences. Madam Chair, I'd like to pull that. 
Um, I just like um, some reassurance that that particular uh, uh, GAA consideration will not impact the schools that are in that um, area for Sandtown. Okay, I know staff is listening, so okay. Uh, 8.03, policy JLJ, behavioral threat assessment. This is the third reader. Madam Chair, I'd like that pulled if possible. Just for the uh, drafters to have the opportunity to specifically highlight the changes that were made, especially related to special education and the advocacy input um, to that policy. Okay. 8.04, the proposed academic calendar, years 20. 2020, 2021, and 2022. Okay, 8.05, local 44 contract. 8.06, FY20 quarter one budget amendment request. Okay. And then <coughs> 11 point, uh, these are procurements, 11.01, .01, Baltimore City Health Department. 11.02, Project NUMA. 11.03, Equal Opportunity Schools. 11.04, Project Lead the Way. 11.05, Springboard Collaborative. 11.06, Pride Youth Services. 11.07, Future Makers. 11.08, Baltimore Algebra Project. I I'm I'm going to request that not that we pull any of these, but that at some point in the future we key it up that when we get out of school and supplementary programs that we do some sort of mapping with it to understand where it's having impact, um, how, how students are able to access for opportunity of access, ability, uh, where we're maybe missing on supporting after school and before school programs. Okay. So thank you. You take a note of that for So nothing, nothing now, just okay. something for thank you. as we move forward. Okay. 12.01, Care First of Maryland. 12.02, Beacon Health Options Incorporated. 12.03, Air Tech Refrigeration and Mechanical Contractors. 13.01, ENA Services, LLC. 14.01, On-Call Construction Management, Pre-Construction and Construction Services. 14.02, Walters Relocation Incorporated, Allen and Sons Moving, Save a Lot Movers. 14.03, Advanced Fire Protection Systems, LLC. 14.04, IF Fisher Incorporated. Is that I? Yeah. Uh, and 19.01 CNC Advocacy Incorporated and Southwest Partnership Incorporated. Okay. So let's see. I have, let me make sure I have those correct. I have uh, 8.02, 8.03. Are the two that are pulled? Okay. All righty. But this time we'll move into. Item 12.01 for a vote. 12. Okay, 12.01 Care First of Maryland is also being pulled for a vote. All right. Okay. Last call. All right. So at this time, we're going to move into public comment, and we start with the uh, special rec specially recognized groups. And our first group uh, this evening is the Baltimore Teachers Union. Go ahead and start. So tonight, the Baltimore Teachers Union is going to um, give its time to the student group SOMOS to speak. Uh, they're going to speak about high school choice. I'll note that I've taught 
uh, middle school for 12 years, and I've been part of the high school choice process each of those 12 years, most recently as an ESOL teacher, and have seen tremendous issues with it. We've talked with the district many times over many years, and it's just extremely frustrating to still be facing these issues. Um, it touches every single student. There's issues up and down, and tonight is just one part of that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Samreen Shiraz, uh, and I'm a sophomore at Baltimore City College High School and an organizer of SOMOS. Good evening, everyone. My name is Star Kamano Flores. I'm a senior at Baltimore City College High School, and I am also a SOMOS organizer. Good evening. I'm Kimberly Vasquez. Um, I'm a junior at Baltimore City College and a SOMOS organizer. We, student organization, organizing a multicultural open society, SOMOS, tackles with system, systematic injustices in Baltimore City public school system. Currently, we are, we are fighting to make sure that English language learners, ELs, have fair access to highly selective schools. Thank you for all those who are supporting us today. Um, if you are a supporter of SOMOS, can you please stand up? Thank you so much. You can have a seat. Um, we stand here today with the support of Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark, Councilman Zeke Cohen, Councilman Barnett, Baltimore, Baltimoreans of Educational Equity, leaders in educational equity, Principal Hornback, Principal Harkham, Baltimore Teachers Union, ACLU, NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, Figoria of Remax, University of Rio de Janeiro, Morgan State University, UMBC, Teachers Democracy Project, Baltimore City Green Party, Advocates for Children and Youth, Baltimore City Hispanic Commission, Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore City Hispanic Commission, Friends at Patterson Park, Sanctuary Streets Baltimore, Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs, NAACP Baltimore Chapter, Downtown Baltimore Family Alliance, The Intersection, and many more. And like our group name, SOMOS, it means we are, and we are here to uh, fight for the equity for all ELL learners because si se... Puede! Si se... Puede! Si se... Puede! When I was an eighth grader back in 2018, every day the only thing discussed was high school. The only thing I was ex excited about was going into high school. And not just high school, I wanted to go to the best high school. For me, those were my top choices were City and Poly. When the day I was receiving my composite score, I was very excited. The hopes and dreams were filling me. But when I saw that composite score, it broke all my dreams and my, and my heart. I was disappointed by the grade I saw on it. It demolished all my dreams. That composite score made me look as if I was not what I should be or what I had to be. But then I realized that it was on me who had a fall, but it was the seventh grade park test, which I was exempt from, meaning that I was replaced by a zero. But that contradict with the part that I was the valedictorian of the class of 2018 at Vanguard Collegiate Middle School, but still with that low composite score, meaning that I could not have gone to any highly selective schools. But I was lucky to join and fight with SOMOS to recalculate my composite score. However, it was very late when I got to know that I was capable of going to Baltimore City College High School. And if it, not, if it was not SOMOS, I would not have been standing in this position that I am now. Therefore, the, this problem did not stop on me, but it continued to grow, and it will continue to grow if we do not bring and stop. And this Baltimore City public school system is not only going to lose good kids who are super smart in their education, they are eligible of coming to highly selective schools, but they are going to be left behind, and this fight is going to be continued yet again. For instance, I know many kids who are capable of going to these schools, but are not due to this composite score system. Just because I don't speak the language that the general population speak does not mean that I am not capable of defeating them in, in these tests. One of our SOMOS organizers had a friend who, who came from Mexico, and he was one of the top students back in Mexico. He received the best grades, but unfortunately, he was not able to go to highly selective schools, but ended up at Patterson. Now, 
but he went to Patterson, which has a graduation rate of 59%. Despite of him being one of the best students in his middle school, he went to Patterson while he had the chance of being graduated 97% if he has went to those highly selective schools. That's how the story affected me and the friend of our SOMOS organizer. This problem gets expanded when you get to know that you are taking a test in the language that you're not good at. This is discriminating the rights of those ELs because the test used by the district is seventh grade math, park, or, and the uh, reading part testing. And these tests are given to us in English, meaning that we have a hard time understanding the test and while we are doing that, it takes our grade down. And it does not show the, acad the true academic ability of the students. This is why the number of ELs in the highly selective school is not representative in the number of ELs in the school district. According to the Equal Education Opportunities Act, the EL should not be prohibited from participating equally in state and district education programs due to the language barrier. As you can see, this is literally what the school district is doing right now. Those kids are exempted or pipelined directly to schools like Patterson Digit or Digital, whose, whose graduation rate is higher, is lower than schools like City, Poly, Dunbar, or Marvel, while we can have the chance to become one of the best later on. As a result, we need to look at this problem and solve this issue, which is really urgent for the Baltimore City Public School System. We appreciate your atten attention toward this urgent issue. In a moment, my colleagues will discuss about the solution for this inequity policy. Thank you. I believe that you have another uh, segment. Do you want me to flip into that one? Is that what you want? Okay, so I'm going to flip you into, if you don't mind, into the, um, because the Associated uh, Student Congress of Baltimore City also gave you their, their time because the, the, the time for the union is up. I'm, okay? okay? So keep, keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Kimberly again. Um, I want to start off by saying that we are glad Baltimore City Schools has been working on an equity policy. I'm sure we can all agree that our city needs this to disrupt the systems that neg negatively impact students of color, students living in poverty, special education students, undocumented students, ESOL students, and other student populations. All students deserve access to an excellent education. We with this equity policy, I feel as though we are obligated to execute equity throughout our school system. An example of this would be to ensure English language learners have an equal opportunity to enter into highly selective schools like City, Poly, Western, etc. We thank the school district for working around this issue and considering different solutions to this inequity. However, so far, there was, there have not proposed a solution that meaningfully addresses this urgent issue. Hello, I'm Star. Um, so all school district solutions so far would only benefit a small portion of English language learners, but not all. And why? All English learners are being affected by this policy. So why don't all students deserve the district's proposed accommodations? We SOMOs will not accept any policy that does not provide accommodations or recalculations for all students. In the district's most recent proposal, they would consider giving a small percentage of the English language learners the test with an interpreter. Yet, they stated that interpreters would only be available in, quote, the most popular languages. SOMOS believes that this does not achieve equity. Equity means opportunity for all, and this does not give all English language learners a fair opportunity to try to attend these schools. This is why SOMOS does not accept the district's proposed solution and will not until it makes this process fair for all English language learners. We, with the support of ACLU, and N and NAACP legal, fund, legal Defense Fund have done legal research and we've seen that this exact issue is going on in different districts around the country. These cases have been successfully litigated and resulted in meaningful change for English language learners. 
Our solution is to provide these students with a test in their native language and in English. The students speak their native language at home, and at school they learn things in English. This solution will not change the whole process that other students go through. It would be a simple accommodation in which these students need in order to have an accurate me measurement of their academic ability. Another solution which is inexpensive and could be quickly implemented is to calculate percentiles of English language learners by comparing them to other English language learners instead of the general population. This will reveal which students perform highly in comparison to peers facing similar linguistic challenges. Um, with all that being said, it has been two years. It has been two years too long. It is time for a change now. Um, it's time that we give all our EL English language learners <coughs> the opportunity that they deserve to give them a fair and equal composite score system. Um, uh, with all that being said as well, uh, do you, the school board, agree to work with SOMOS to develop a solution for all English learners currently in the eighth grade? Um, hi, I'm overwhelmed. Um, <laughs> no, um, hi, Somos. Um, I know you guys very well. Um, very, very well articulated, very well put together. I love the entire thing. Um, I think I can speak for everyone here that we all support you, and we all support the idea of making sure that everyone in the school system is equally and equitably uh put on the same standard as each other, regardless of the barrier, regardless of what they come from or where they're going. We all want to make sure that everyone is still on the same path to achieving their goals in life and being able to get into the higher schools like City, Poly, and Western, and Merville, and Dunbar, and all those other great schools. Um, I also want to just, could you dive a little bit more deeper into um, the one of the plans, um, preferably the first one? Um, I just wanted to get a little bit more in depth of what you see um, how would you see that going about? What kind of support would you need regarding that, um, regarding the uh, Spanish, oh, well, sorry, the other language and the English version? Um, what do you see coming out of that? So the solution presented by SOMOS was to give the English language learner the test in their native language. It's the same as giving the general population the test in English and giving me the test in Spanish. We both understand the same thing, but just the different language. Um, we want the district to translate those tests into these lang languages so it would be easy for the kids to understand and perform best on the exam. We also propose that they can have English and the native language because it would make it easy and not make them rely just on the native language but also get some understanding from the English test too. Um, and we said that if the if the district could not provide this issue, the problem, the solution to this issue, they can also have oral translators provided to, provide it to them. But as, I, as you said before, not to only some languages, but all languages provided because we need equity, and which, which will be given if given to all, not just some. OK, I, I, I'm, no, I just have a couple of questions just for some clarification. First, I, I, I thank you um, for, your, for your presentation. I also want to thank you because I, I had heard you previously, and I was happy to hear tonight that you were, were really being very inclusive of all um, English language learners. So thank you for that one. I just want to be clear on the test that we're talking about. We're talking about the state I'm, I'm a little unclear as to what test is. I, I know the assessments, but I don't know a, a separate one in the seventh grade other than the state mandated test. Is that what we're talking about? So the solution presented by the district was to use the I-Ready test. And we want that test to be have those accommodations. Okay, that was that was the a part of the, of what had been discussed earlier as in addition to the to using the park scores. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So yeah, um, sorry, 
First of all, I just want to thank the SOMA students for being here. And um, we have been working with the SOMA students for two years on this, and they have really had uh, showed a lot of leadership in this issue and really thought through a lot of uh, complex recommendations and really analyzed the issue. So their leadership on this issue is really admirable, and they are the, some of the sharpest students that, um, that I've worked with in terms of really thinking through um, a difficult uh, problem. So thank you. Um, I, I think in our most recent, so back when this problem was originally raised two years ago by SOMOS, um, we did we changed the process um, for the choice process. And I think the problem that they identified is, is, legit, is a very legitimate issue, which is that the key times for a composite score consideration, the key times in a student's life is their seventh grade year for their grades and their test scores, and then the first quarter of eighth grade. So if that happens to be the time when you're learning English, you know, when you're an English language learner, that's going to be a hard time for you to compete for the composite score to really fairly represent what what you're capable of doing. And so that's the challenge that um, that they that they raised with us, which is which is absolutely the case. So what we um, uh, um, agreed to do at that point and have been doing um, since then is that we then review the um, the uh, scores of all the students who are currently in English language learners. We look um, at their English language acquisition during that period of time. Um, we do two things. One is we ask for any teacher recommendations of particular students who um, they think are really are that their composite score is not reflecting their cap capacity. We also then review the English language acquisition for that period of time to see for students who are outliers. So as um, um, the students identified a, kind of a variation on that of comparing students, um, English language learners, to other English language learners, the way we do that is by looking at the students who have um, their growth in English language acquisition is, is out of the norm, is faster. And is that measured by the WIDA currently? Yes, by okay. the WIDA. And so once we do that, then for those students, and, and we look at all English language learners um, to, to for those indicators. Then we offer those students an opportunity to then, uh, we, we look at their, par I'm sorry, their iReady scores later in their eighth grade year because part of the issue is that the um, acquisition of language can be very fast for some students. And so the difference of where a student is in their learning in the beginning of seventh grade versus the end of eighth grade can be just light years apart. And so because of that, we give us, um, we look at their scores later in the, in the year in eighth grade to see where they are at that point in time. And um, as, as Samreen mentioned, the part of the challenge is um, that then they don't hear about whether they're being admitted to school until later in the school year, which is hard on students because their friends have heard and, and their colleagues have heard, and they don't hear till later. But the reason that we do that is because we want to give the maximum amount of time to, for the student to, to have the best representation of their, um, of their facility with the language. And so we wait till later in the year to use that test score as, as one of the ones. Did you have a question? I did, just a quick one. Does mm -hmm. waiting, is there an additional burden in waiting t till later in the year on the number of seats available? So or, that, is the, or is the burden, and I'm not minimizing the emotional burden yes, of hearing yeah. later, but is there also a just a competitiveness, like in terms of number of seats filled, that if you take the exam in eighth, you're that has not been that hasn't been a okay. challenge. Um, so. We do that, I think, and so that has resulted in students um, being selected through these schools that were not selected through their composite score. One of the challenges with the numbers, and, and, and rightly, again, the SOMA students have been very focused on data and really researching this problem, so they have rightly asked for data to, to look at this issue. One of the things is that when you look at the data, you have to look both at the um, English language learners when you look at how many students were accepted to the um, competitive high schools, as well as recently exited, because for a number of students, Students, they during that pivotal time they may have been an English language learner during seventh grade during that pivotal time or eighth grade but by the time they enter um, high school or sometime during that period of time they be they exit English language so they are reflected in the recently exited so when you look at the numbers for the students who are um, admitted into the selective high schools you have to look at both the English language learners and the recently exited students to really get a picture of what's going on now given all that we still need to keep looking at it to make sure we really have a process that's robust, that's figuring out the most equitable way to consider this challenge. So in our most recent meeting, what we talked about was with, um, with the students was that for, we, I mean, we looked at this, the solutions they provided, and again, 
hands, I mean, hats off to the students who do a lot of work trying to think through various policy ideas. And so we looked at things like finding alternative, uh, a test with an alternative in, an, in other languages. And there's not a lot of choices there. Um, there aren't very many tests that have that come in other languages, and if they do, for the most part, they just have Spanish. So that's one of the challenges. What we came up with as a solution was um, having a translator, identifying students to who we wanted to look at later iReady scores, inviting them to take a special um, the iReady test at a special time because I think one of the students we one of the concerns we heard from students was that just looking at their regular iReady may not have the same level of like. Um, high, like they might not take it as seriously because they don't know it's a, a meaningful test. So inviting them to a special um, administration of it where we would have um, proctors and we would have translators. And the issue in terms of the languages that I think we said was that we will try to get um, translators in any language we can. There are just some languages where it may be hard to find somebody as a translator. It's not that we wouldn't do it if we could find one. It's just some. there are some languages that may be hard to find a proctor who could um, also translate. I um, just, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not going to stop the conversation, but we do have a um, just gotten a notice from the uh, police outside that there is a car blocking a Silver Highlander tag 2A24603. Uh, you need to move your car immediately. Okay. That's Silver Highlander tag 2A, I think that's Z4603. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so I don't think uh, the WIDA score of a student necessarily say they can't be successful at City, Poly, Western, other highly selective schools. And I also want to add, why are we talking about recently exited ESOL students, English language learners who have been here three or less years? Um, we're uh, basically prohibiting them from like going to schools um, that are highly selective schools. Um, it's a difference between currently being an English language learner and re like exited. Um, so it's not that we're prohibiting them. I think what I'm saying is that there are a number, when you look at the numbers of the, and the data that we gave you, when you look at the exited students, within those numbers are students who were English language learners during the pivotal time when their composition, when their composite score was considered, so that they were in seventh grade, um, they were English language learner, or sometime during eighth grade. So that's why we keep, that's one of the reasons why we keep looking back at recently exited, is because those numbers include students like some of the students who are part of SOMOS, when they, they were English language learners at the time their um, composite scores were calculated, we reconsidered their composite score and then by the time they entered their school of choice, they were an exited student. So you have to look at both. Okay. Okay, any other question or comment? Okay. Okay, thank you all. And we have we have your information. Um, we will be. Co I mean, you'll c we're continuing to work, but we will also consider the information that you have shared with us and and the, and the testimony from t this evening. Okay, thank you. Is that okay, Linda? So thank you all for that. And just I think it, it tees up something really important for us as a board. And I think one of the things we, we might want to look at is after figuring out where there's, where's the right time. Is it after the October 1 count so we know who's actually registering and attending? Or is it after the announcements have gone out for where you're accepted? But to look at all our, our screened programs for our demographic match, for, for students with special needs, um, for geographic areas around the city, are there pockets, are there people we're missing? Um, and that's not to take away from the conversation about L's, but I think it really tees up something for us to start saying where are our other holes? What are, what are we missing for other folks? So thank you. Okay. No, and I, I would just agree with you, Commissioner Hassan, and I think one of the things that um, Chair Chinia um, asked on the side while, you know, while the young people were, were transitioning in, um, in their presentation um, was about entrance criteria, period. Right? And so what we know now 
um, is that we are actually in a period of transition away from entrance criteria for some of our schools already. And part of what is pushing on this question, and this is something that existed long before I ever lived in Baltimore, um, is composite scores, period, as entrance criteria. And I think as the young people rightly referenced, um, there are lots of school districts right now, as you know, Commissioner, um, and as many know, um, par part of the debate nationwide is around entrance criteria for selective high schools. So part of what we are pushing in on in this question, and I'm glad that you signaled it, is a larger question of entrance criteria, period, because we can control, e even if we work for this one group of students, and albeit, you know, and I say all the time, L's are our fastest growing student population in city schools. So we have to resolve this. Um, but part of why it is a pressure point is because there is something called a composite score. And so the, you know, the, the thing we're going to have to wrestle with as a community is what are the implications of having a composite score, period. We know that there are schools for whom that criteria by state mandate not even by district. The state has said you can no longer use composite scores or any entrance criteria for schools that have, you know, career programming. And so we know that some of our schools here, again, have traditionally had entrance criteria that now the state is mandating must go away. So it is a, all you have to do is Google those school districts and you will see that it is highly contentious. So I just, I was glad that you said that and I just wanted to kind of push period on how, how we are going to grapple with the policy implications of a composite score. Because just fixing it for one group, as you noted, does not fix it for students with disabilities, does not fix it for, you know, students who arrive <coughs> who are chronically absent, right? I mean, we have a lot of very gifted kids who don't come to school, and if you, if, if you, if you don't have the grades, then your composite score falls off a cliff as well. So, th so there's a lot of implications that I think we're going to have to wrestle with together about what we as a city believe about entrance criteria, period. Because once we, once we address L's, we are going to have to address all of those other groups. Right? Equity is not just one group. Equity cuts across all groups. So once we deal with L's, what does that mean about the other groups of students? And does that mean that the city is at a place where the long-held dear composite score and entrance criteria, which I was told when I came here was the third rail, and don't mess with it, Yes, because it's a composite score, right? Like maybe it's time to have a much broader equity discussion. If we're going to talk about equity, then let's have a much larger equity discussion and not just one piece of tinkering with the machine. So if we're going to go equity, then let's go equity. And I, and I would also add the other side of that beyond, um, you know, the question of the composite score for entrance is then um, for all of the groups that we're mentioning, uh, the, the type of support that is then available at the school for any student who enters. So that just because there was a composite score that someone passed doesn't mean that they don't still need supports. So uh, you have you touched on a, a, a conversation that we, we have to have a, a lot more of. And, and again, thank you. I think Dr. Santelisa said it very well earlier in terms of um, student voice uh, really coming prepared and helping adults uh, to, to take up things that we need to deal with. So thank you. And then just one more small piece in closing, just in this conversation to not lose fact, uh, track of the fact that there are some non-exclusive high schools that have some amazing programs right. and some fabulous teachers and some great leaders and really strong students yeah. coming out. So, so in this conversation, that might have been given the impression the board thought that. We don't. We know there's great things happening around the district. Good. Um, our, our next recognized group, I think, to speak this evening is the uh, Parent Community Advisory Board. Good evening, Commissioners. Dr. Sanalisis. 
Thank you for your time this evening. PCAB recently put forth three community candidates to be interviewed by the Chief of Staff for open PCAB seats. Uh, these potential members bring proven track records for engagement for the benefit of our students and families, and they represent PCAB's continued commitment to mirroring the diversity of our board with the diversity of our city. Having checked in with the Chief of Staff post-interview is the recommendation of PCAB's Executive Committee that Rachel Duncan, Larry Simmons, and Courtly Witherspoon be immediately approved to occupy CEO seats on PCAB. For parents, students, and community members who are interested, there are four more seats available. The Executive Committee also had the opportunity to meet with district staff members in the Legislative Office to better understand agenda items going into this year's session. The day that we spoke with this office is the day that Governor Hogan made an announcement introducing his legislation. The PCAP Executive Committee continues to be disappointed and infuriated by the governor's attempts to overshadow the real issues. It is our belief that providing adequate resources and holding the district accountable to high academic standards aren't mutually exclusive values. That both must happen and we recognize the dependencies that exist. On behalf of parents and community members, PCAB is interested in hearing directly from a few board members this evening what their thoughts are about the governor's proposal. These parents and community members believe that they hear Dr. Sanalisis's position often and not board members' positions enough. Needless to say, PCAB was excited to learn that all schools would be getting a social worker and a community school coordinator this academic year. We know that recruitment, screening, and onboarding take time, and PCAB is requesting an update that specifically shares what schools have not yet onboarded one or both positions. In late January, PCAB's gonna issue a written semester report that will include its community engagement efforts, parental and community assessment of Dr. Sanalisis's engagement, parental and community assessment of the Board of Commissioners engagement outside of this boardroom, and its role in transparently providing information to the community, both proactively and reactively. In addition, the report will include a mid-academic year assessment of policies slated to be drafted and shared with parents and how compliance with these policies has been monitored. To ensure our neutrality in our assessment, parents, students, teachers, and other community members should look for a survey to become available for 30 days beginning this Friday. So um, with that said, I'm happy to hear from a couple of board members just individual positions on the governor's legislation and then to take any questions that you might have of PCAP. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to give you a position from the board as, and I will just let you know that um, our our board as a part of the Maryland Associations of Boards of Education, we're very, very active, um, are supportive of the recommendations from the current commission and are working, uh, talking with our legislators and others and other advocates in terms of supporting any legislation that comes uh, towards those recommendations. Uh, that's the position of our board. Uh, we have a, a, a legislative representative who, is, who, who works very closely um, and will be a part of uh, what is happening in Annapolis as uh, Commissioner Bondima, but that is the position of the board. Thank you very much. So with, with all due respect, while that speaks to the position of the board associated with the Kerwin legislation, I don't know that it addresses the question that parents and community members specifically asked about this board's position on Governor Hogan's proposed legislation. And, and I would I would just add to say that for public comment time right now we're not we're not in a position to answer that. If you would like something in writing, we'll send you a response to that, but cannot do that this evening without reviewing fully. We will look for something in writing Thank you. that we will share with parents. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to move to the uh, public comment, general public comment. And the first uh, person listed is Mr. Sekou Kasumu.
Dr. Santelisis, Madam Chair, and Madam Co-Chair, Commissioners, as we all know or should know, the General Assembly convenes next month, I think around the 8th, less than a month from today. I'm concerned that we get the issue about arming our school police officers on the legislative agenda. I work the metal detector. I take mace from students. I take stun gun from students. I take sharpened instruments from students. And they want to know why they can't carry weapons for their own protection. I say, the school police are here to protect you. And they say, they don't have guns. How are they going to protect us? This is an ongoing problem. And if you're talking about creating an atmosphere conducive to learning, you say you understand that they need to feel safe and protected. And I'm maintaining that this body, since it's in support of Army and our school police officers after the incident back in February, that you refresh the recollection of those legislators down in Annapolis who use y'all as scapegoats, because they always used to say, unless y'all got on board with it, there was nothing they could do. But now that this body is no longer in opposition to harming our school police officers within the school buildings, we need to tell them again down in Annapolis, we want equal protection for Baltimore City students. Like all the other students in the state have armed resource officers in their building. So again, I'm asking you, what do I tell the students when I take their weapons and they say, you can't protect me with an empty holster. I'm sorry. Thank you, and I apologize. I'm trying to get something straight with the agenda. But I know others were listening, so I do apologize, Mr. Cosmo, for not listening uh, closely. So can I get an answer to my question? What do I tell them when I take their weapons that they carry for self-defense? Because our school police officers aren't allowed to carry guns. What do I tell them? So is this issue going to be on the legislative agenda for this session coming? I know that you had emailed me earlier, and you probably didn't see yet that I emailed you back. But while I was sitting here, so you probably didn't get a chance to see it. I don't um, don't think it will come up in this legislative session because there's so much on the agenda with regards to Kerwin and with uh, regards to the um, what is it? Uh, the construction bill, which I just had it in my head and just lost the name of that bill. Um, those two bills will be the focus of most, you know, of the education energy this uh, session. I'm not aware of any member of a, any of our delegation introducing a bill either. Um, but I, at a, when, with the, with what the legislature has on its plate to try to get Kerwin and the construction bill passed, I just, I think it's highly unlikely this bill will come up this session. In 90 days, you can't get this on the agenda? A 90 day session? You can't talk to uh, the delegate that pushed it the last one or two times? What, what I will say is uh, we will share what you've said this evening. Um, we During the forum for when we were discussing the legislative agenda, this, it, this did not come up at our forum, but um, we'll take note of what you're saying. We do have some meetings with the city delegation that are planned with the board, and so that can be something that we can share. How could it not come up? As serious a uh, situation I, as it is, how could it not come up Mr. after what we've Mr. been going Cosmo, through? It was, a, it was a, a forum which was open to the public, and that it didn't come up because um, when we presented uh, the issues that the, the ones that were mentioned to you and opened the floor for additional, we did not receive that. that. That's the only reason. Okay, I would appreciate if this board would contact the delegate that led the mission the last session to resubmit the bill. I would appreciate it. We will discuss that with, with the delegates. I can promise you that uh, when we meet with the city delegation, the concern that you're bringing to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is uh, Keith Zimmerman, VTU. Uh, 
Madam Chair, Dr. Santelisis, members of the board, my name is Keith Zimmerman. Um, I'm here at the request of the Baltimore Teachers Union with basically a slight technical um, change that we request be made to the uh, child abuse and neglect reporting uh, and other requirements of uh, regulation. Uh, in my handout, I have a copy of the proposed um, changes and I commend uh, the system in coming up with the proposed changes. Uh, this, is, this is a very important regulation and since we're trying to bring things more up to date and in compliance with the law, I'm suggesting that the regulation incorporate into it the guidelines set forth by the uh, Attorney General of the State of Maryland, which has never been in uh, this policy, but the policy purports to follow it. And it's just some technical language that I've added on page 4 of 10, and I would request that you uh, take it uh, into consideration in uh, revising the uh, regulation. That's all. Okay, we, we'll pass this on to uh, to the policy committee and the folks who are working on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. our, our next speaker is, is it Denora Almas? Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dinora Olmos, and I am the founding executive director of the Latino Education Advancement Fund. And um, I'm here, I don't know the number, the minutes are okay? Yeah. Okay. And I'm here uh, especially, especially to support um, the group Somos, but also to add one more item to the situation of uh, school choice and in regards especially to ESOL students, yes, but also special needs students. As a matter of fact, um, some of the parents that came that unfortunately have to leave because their children were here, etc. but some of these parents have students with special needs and students who are twice exceptional. We are talking of students who are, in a way, gifted, but not in all the areas. And so the problem with this is that the process and the protocol that is in the school system at the moment, which is it's good at a certain point. The problem is that do you know that if the parent doesn't request specifically to ask for extended time on the IEP of the student, that extended time does, does it is not given to the student during park test? That is what is happening those students are not getting extended time. And what happens when they, and they are in seventh or eighth grade, when they look into a school choice, their composite score, it doesn't measure up. And my question is, why are we not providing access to the students? You want me to say something? Yeah, so what I would, so, so there's a couple things that I would need to clarify. For every student to receive extended time, it has to be either part of their IEP or their 504. Correct. That, that, that is across the board. If the, I just want to make sure I'm hearing the challenge correctly so that, to make sure I'm understanding. The, the challenge is a number of the ELL families who were here with you this evening and others are finding it difficult to get the assessment of their ELL student child by the system, by special education, that would yield in their estimation extended testing time. Am I understanding correctly? Yes, there are two situations and they are both of them are what you just described. Okay. And what I what I said is that I would like to add one extra, I would say I would say I will plant the seed that we really need to pay attention in what is happening in some schools. Because some students with a special needs, students who have an IEP, they do not receive extended time. And therefore, Understood. when it's a school of choice, mm -hmm. they don't have the composite score because they didn't receive the extended time. Okay, so, so there's, there's two pieces. Number one, if a student, and as a mother, 
with a child who has extended time in her 504, right? If it is, if, if a student has the extra time in their IEP or 504, and that extra time is not being granted, that is in violation of the child's IEP and 504, and I would recommend that you flag that directly to Dr. Brooks in the I already did. Okay, you did? Before did. tonight or tonight? No, a week ago. Okay, so it'll probably take more than a week, right, to see the full follow through on that. So they're working on I just want to make sure that it's logged and I know the time period. Mm -hmm. The other piece is that in the case of families who cannot get the assessment for their child, right, they should also see the Office of Special Education for the evaluation and the work with the, um, the, work with the family and the school, okay? That's correct. And it is the right flag, and I will also add, even though I know it's public comment, that <clears throat> part of what I am going to be taking a look at based on my conversation with ESOL teachers, with principals, is our intake process. I have heard an earful over the last two weeks about our intake process for our ELL families. Correct. And incomplete, to your point, information going from the intake process to schools and schools feeling as if they are not getting the full complete picture of ELL students who are coming to their school. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to you so that you know that is in my head. Good. I've been hearing it the last few weeks as I meet with families, teachers, and principals, and that's something that I'm flagging for our enrollment choice and transfer team, our ESOL team, and our special education team. The other piece where it comes out with regard to some of our some of our students is also being twice gifted, right? Correct. So we also in our identification of students for gifted and advanced learning um, need to shore up. What I will tell you is that the plus of having, in addition to enriching um, the diversity of our district, the influx of large numbers of ELL families is pushing what frankly prior to the last few years as somebody who came from a system prior to this that had 35 percent ELL learners was frankly paltry infrastructure and part of that was because the district did not have numbers now we have the numbers and so the infrastructure has to follow so I just I'm only saying that so that you know that I hear you Thanks. And it's part of what kind of the next stage of work we have to do separate from, I should say, or including the work that the, that the SOMOS young people brought forth today. But I just want you to know that the ELL piece is on my radar. Because th th there's, there's a number of places where kids, families are falling through the cracks that we have to tighten up. So Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, um, I do appreciate all your support especially for the case of the ELL students and school choice. I think that they deserved an equal opportunity and access. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy for the students. Our next speaker is Melissa Schober. Hello, good evening. I'm also here to talk about school choice, though from a middle school perspective. As many of the board members know, the middle school process drives to some degree a student's eligibility for one of the selective high schools through weighting of the student's GPA in middle through some selective programs like Ingenuity and Advanced Academics. In Last year, I used MPIA and $285 to get data on students who are enrolled in Advanced Academics. Nearly 40% of the students who are enrolled in advanced academics in the 17-18 year are white. That is a disproportionate number compared to what we have in city schools. And at the time that I received that data, zero, zero students who had an IEP were enrolled in advanced academics. This year, I'm the parent of a sixth grader who has an IEP and is a twice exceptional student. And although I am an N of one, and therefore this holds no scientific weight, I can tell you that my experience as a parent of a child who is both gifted 
and has special needs related to a stroke that she suffered in 2017 has been poor. I have had repeated IEP meetings and outreach to teachers and principals about the fact that although my child is capable, that does not mean that she does not need accommodations. Although you have these programs for advanced academics and ingenuity, it strikes me in talking to other parents through Facebook pages for special education and CCAC that principals and teachers are wholly unprepared to deal with parents and children who, for example, need extended time and also are gifted. And I'm asking you tonight how we can have an equity policy and numbers that show no students with an IEP were admitted in 1718 and less than 10 with a 504 were admitted in 1718 to advanced academics. These are not the numbers of a district that respects equity and recognizes the gifts of students who may be differently abled. Apart from that, I know that there has been a commitment by this body to expand advanced academics and other honors programs to all zip codes. Respectfully, I would push back and ask if the quality of teaching in those programs is truly uniform, given that some of the schools that offer honors programs today are also on the state's list of comprehensive support improvement schools, meaning that they are in the lowest 5% of performing K through eight schools or graduate less than 67% of their high school seniors. Please do not tell me as a parent who can do math that those programs are equivalent when those are the numbers of students who are graduating or performing well in those buildings. That is a lie and you know it. In addition, this district has a high number of homeless students and we give no quarter to the fact that students experience events covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act and McKinney-Vento and sit for park. We are expecting students to have a Herculean effort as fourth graders, 10 and 11 year olds, to get into a middle school program that meets their needs. I want you to think carefully about whether or not that's an equitable and indeed moral process for the children that you represent. Our next speaker is uh, Zalima Moore. everyone. Oh, that's terrible. Good evening, everyone. There we go. There we go. My name is Zelaine Masakwa Moore, and I am the very proud principal of the William S. Bear School. Today, we wanted to speak to you regarding the believe in bear. <laughs> Behind me are the staff who represent the voices of students ages 3 through 21 who believe in bear. Bear School, stand up. Today, we represent over almost 200 students who have a variety of disabilities. We represent the students at, in the Baltimore City Public Schools that are the most medically fragile, but in our hearts, they are the best ones. Our students make gains every single day, but we are their voices. Our students are exposed to the regular curriculum, just like their peers. Our students are reading books like The Life of Pi and Co-Talkers. They're having those books modified for them and presented to them. But as they're going through their academic day, they're suffering through things that are needed. As they go from their cafeteria to their uh, classroom, the hallways at Bear are extremely warm. This evening, we're coming to the board asking that you support the funding for our HVAC system in the building. We have been promised HVAC many, many times, 
and our hope is that this time the funding stays and does not disappear. Our students suffer from temperature regulation dysfunction. And what that means is that our students, when often we would have a light jacket on, they have on blankets and hats and they're covered up. On an evening like today, it's kind of murky outside, but it's not necessarily very cold. Many of the students at Bear would be extremely cold and not able to regulate how they're feeling. So what we're asking is to be able to control the temperature in the building, control the temperatures in classrooms. What I'm asking the board to be able to do today is we need your help. I need you to be able to believe in Bayer the way that we do. All of the people standing behind me who believe in Bayer, <laughs> want you to believe in our babies too. Don't forget our kids. We represent the students that are some of the lowest functioning in city schools, but they are city school students. And they are your kids too, as much as mine. Care about our kids, care about all kids. Know that all kids matter. Thank you. I'm Graham Kastendike. I'm next on the list, but I don't need to say anything more. I'm the chairman of the board of the William Bear School Partnership Board who support the children there. And we want to thank you all for your support to our school. But we really do need this HVAC. We've been running on, the board has been buying individual units for the last 10 years. And we're quite frankly running out of money to do it. So this is medically necessary. And we appreciate all your support going forward. Thank you. And thank our supporters. Thank you, and please know that we believe in Bear also, um, and are working. Uh, hey, I'll take a shirt any day you want to give me one. I, I love Bear. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna. We're gonna get another answer, but just know that yes, we and uh, uh, you stay on our minds. I, I know we're gonna give you a better answer than mine, um, but. Uh, I also am happy that you are sharing some of, of uh, the needs that we do have as a system, especially around facilities. And uh, even as we talk about other things that we want to do in terms of programming, having our children in buildings that are conducive for their health as well as, as their learning is important. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief of Staff and then uh, Commissioner Bondi. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and so I just want to let, I, I, hopefully you know that the full HVAC replacement for Bear School is on the agenda tonight. So um, did that, I think it did already pass it on? on the consent. It was on the consent. It will, it, will be voted on. it will be voted on soon. So it was on the consent. It was not pulled, right? Right. So it was on the consent, so they will vote for it soon. And we'd like to thank Cindy Smith, Cynthia Smith, also who's been working on our behalf. She's a wonderful lady who is very dedicated to Baltimore City School System. Thank you. Thank you. Before you walk out, I don't know if you remember, I was one of the speakers uh, at your school. I came to your graduation. Yes, and I've remember. been an advocate of your school for many, many, many years, even when Coppin was working over there, Dr. Geraldine Waters and Shirley Edwards, um, I remember. all of them, they were active over there. And I just want you to know that what I saw and what I participated in was absolutely outstanding. And I would like to come back and visit at any time, but I think that um, you're doing an outstanding, wonderful job at the school. And I just wanted to say that to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. You guys, you can come and see us anytime. Uh, one more, Commissioner Hassan. So I just want to pub. No, and, and you can. We can do this while you walk we back. Like it in the hot. I just want to okay. publicly thank you from the students at Morgan State University who come to Bear and learn to be better teachers for each and every student in Baltimore City. So thank you very much to all the teachers and administrators who support my students in your school. You guys are amazing. Oh, Have okay. a wonderful evening. And just, just to let you know, item 1404 that I called and no one said pull is the item that, that you want to listen for. We're going to put it on a shirt, 1404. Right. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're not leaving until we hear it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. St. Lee. Don't, for, uh, don't forget the t-shirt, though. <laughs> Frank with Petanella. Good evening. 
Uh, Madam Chair, um, Dr. Santelisis, and members of the school board. My name is Frank Petnella. I'm a senior education advocate for the ACOU of Maryland. And we're here tonight to support SOMOS in their efforts to ensure that ELL students have an equal opportunity to be considered for the city's flagship high schools, such as City, Poly, and Western. Um, you know that we are very active in Annapolis in um, pushing for Kerwin and making sure that um, the race equity language as well as wealth equ equity language in that bill um, is strong and that meets the needs of Baltimore City students. And uh, you're aware of um, our new complaint under the Bradford versus the State Board of Education lawsuit. Um, but Sumos, uh, Somos brought this issue, issue to us um, almost two years ago, and we've been working to support them since then. Our legal team took a look at the vast information and data that Somos has compiled and the language in the Federal Equal Educational Opportunities Act and provided this statement. Quote, from what we can tell, it seems the way city schools eligibility criteria are set up excludes ELL students because the criteria require a mastery of the English language that bars anyone who hasn't mastered the language from attending, which gives fewer educational opportunities for ELL students than non-ELL students. The EEOA Title VI and the constitutional protections guarantee that students not be discriminated against on the basis of their national origin, and as it stands, there are few, if any, ELL students who are able to enter schools in Baltimore that have entry requirements, like City and Poly." End quote. Um, I'm encouraged by the conversation that happened tonight. Um, so we encourage you to continue working with SOMOS, and we know the policy committee has a meeting with them uh, next week. So uh, we encourage you to continue working um, with them, and um, this is very much in line with um, the way uh, the direction city schools is going in terms of their equity policy and uh, really being proactive about addressing these equity issues. So uh, thank you and um, we're also available to help or support in any way. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our final person uh, for this evening is uh, Kim Truhart. is not enough. Happy December. As a member of the Algebra Project Board of Directors, I want to thank you for the vote that I believe you will be casting for their contract, um, an opportunity for our young people to be employed is always a good thing. Um, going back to the school safety discussion a little bit ago, I had a piece of legislation introduced last year um, around an auxiliary volunteer school safety team. And I was assured last session that your um, endeavors over this year would incorporate some of the tenets that I laid out in that legislation. I'm disappointed because I don't think you did. Um, so my question to you is, should I reintroduce it this year? I don't need an answer right now, but just think about it because I'm, I'm leaning that way. My hat says, be more clean and green team. I am proud to say that I received a grant from the mayor's office to engage nine former squeegee workers that I took off the corners for five weeks in intensive love sessions with me. They were um, talked to, coached, mentored. They received 10 hours of OSHA, 10 workplace safety training of the, the ones that continued in the program. Four of them passed and now have their OSHA 10 certification. We also did CPR, first aid, and AED training with them. Um, six of the young men successfully got their certifications in CPR and first aid. Um, this week, um, being the sixth week of the program, I really don't have more funding for them, but they're showing up anyway. At least they showed up yesterday and today. And we worked on resumes filling out job applications, 
Um, I have asked a myriad of individuals, corporations, nonprofits to um, put one job on the table to employ these young men. I've come to city schools as well. Reckon Parks possibly will give me two jobs for them. Um, Department of Transportation is looking at a job for them. And these are very basic entry level jobs, but these young men now have these certifications, um, which puts them above the crowd. I'm proud of them. Um, I'm producing my outcomes and reporting of what occurred over the last five weeks and I'll share those with you as well. And I thank you in advance, because I know y'all are going to find at least one entry-level job for them. Um, I had lunch Saturday with the interim principal at Pimlico, celebrating her one-year anniversary as the interim principal. That school, if you recall, I was making public comments about the climate and the atmosphere. I, it is turned around <laughs> and, and I am proud to know this principal, this woman who has put her heart and soul into that school. Um, and I haven't heard any bad news coming out of Pimlico this school year. Great stuff, thank you. Thank you for that good news, thank you. Mr. Hook, uh, is it possible, and I'm, I'll just say my memory isn't that great, and I probably don't have everything, but could you, uh, I, and I know you probably have it somewhere, but if not, would you share with us, um, with uh, Mr. Gant, the, the components of the, of the bill that you talked about last year, and we can add that to some of our conversations. Later. I shall. Thank you. One last thing, if I may. Um, I, in my Be More Clean and Green program, two of them did not graduate high school. One dropped out in the ninth grade. He's 20 years old. His behavior, his thinking, his vocabulary is stuck in the ninth grade. A traditional GED program will not help this young man. And he's reluctant to go into that. I need help finding alternatives for him as a 20-year-old who is, is in a, on the OSHA um, safety test. He scored a 47. Um, and I attribute that to a lot. Um, I'm not letting go of him. So just let, he, is, he is in my pocket. Forever. Kim, uh, need help. I'll reach out to you and we'll get our re-engagement center involved and see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the um, consent agenda, and I'm hoping that I'm <laughs> that I'm I'm straight. You know, there are some items um, we have pulled um, two <laughs> items, and then there are also some items that I have to be certain that we do our vote certain ways uh, for our student commissioner. So we have pulled item 8.02, um, the waiver request for the lot uh, charter lottery. Someone, is staff here? I think there was an was item that was asked. Commissioner McFadden, I'll let you, I think you had the question. It's not uh, necessarily for Clay Hill, but just for um, New Song. And I'm looking through the appendix also, and they're capped, I think, at this recommendation is for um, 30, I think 30%. Yes. Um, so I just want uh, some confirmation um, on if we approve this, it will not adversely impact the other schools that are in that geographic location, particularly um, Sandtown Achievement Academy. Okay. I'm jumping ahead to our appendix where we go through 
um, the numbers. So one way of looking at the waiver request is um, a way to control the numbers of students who are being pulled from each of these zones. So um, if you look at the total number of students who hailed from each of the three impacted zones, Harlem Park, Henson, and as um, you mentioned, Sandtown Winchester Achievement Academy, there was a total of 121 students who attended New Song from those zones. Um, by controlling with the GAA waiver, um, waiver for um, preference, you're allowing 108 preference seats at their maximum enrollment. So that would be school year 22-23 is the first time they would reach maximum uh, peak enrollment. Um, and that number is still fewer than the number of students they currently have hailing from those zones. Um, additionally, with the GAA waivers, um, those numbers need to be reevaluated every year to ensure that they're maintaining that ratio. So it is a way to control the number of students um, attending New Song as they convert to a charter who are coming from those school zones um, and allowing the remainder of those seats to be citywide. So students who have the, the geographic preference who live in that neighborhood would then be waitlisted after a certain point, after 108 <coughs> seats. What happens with that waitlist? So when like a student transfers from the school or how does the wait list work? Um, that's a question for Angela. <laughs> how does the wait list work when a student transfers out of Well, like if a student is put on a wait list for a school, they, how, how do they get selected to go to the school that they're wait listed for? So there's um, different periods of time where someone might pull from their wait list. Um, uh, charters tend to um, stop pulling from the wait list early in the year. So it's less likely to happen later in the year. They tend to um, finalize their enrollment um, before the 930 count um, and then don't, don't necessarily pull later in the year. Um, it just goes in order, so they're you know they're trying to meet a cap number, um, and so um, the lotteries happen in February. By April, um, they, and then they send out uh, acceptance packets to families. Families have to confirm in writing um, by April, which is aligned to the choice uh, decline process when um, uh, students are finalizing their decisions around choice. So all of that's happening in the same window. Um, and so families have to confirm that they're going to actually accept this seat and not another seat. Um, and so what happens is starting in May, you start to really get down into the wait list. You might start soon, depending on where you are in terms of your target number of students you're trying to accept at those grade levels. Uh, and it continues throughout the summer into to early September. But they have to go in order that is set by the wait list. Um, in terms of uh, pulling the students. Um, because there's a geographic attendance area, um, we're talking about having it at 30%, they have to take steps to kind of control that ratio so they're not over pulling from that 30%. So it's its its own wait list, and then there's the citywide wait list. So they have to manage those two things, uh, checking to make sure they hit those target. If... Um, at a certain point, we see they're pulling more students from the geographic attendance area um, that is above the 30%. We suspend the preference. You can't continue the preference until the, the ratio is back in line. Okay. So they have to maintain the ratio over time. Um, and so the, the geographic attendance area is our best way to protect um, the uh, Sandtown yeah, Winchester the zone. Because of citywide lottery, what happens is then you can just pull most and most for most schools, their greatest number of students is going to come from kids who live around that right. school. Um, and so this actually puts some limitations on that. So this is our best way to control that. Like not having it would actually be more harmful than having it because it sets it at a, uh, a particular percentage that we monitor and the school has to monitor to maintain that ratio over time. So it's your best way to, to protect um, that zone as much as possible. Um, and so that's your kind of mechanism. And I will say that New Song is cognizant of that. They understand that. That was fully in their um, application about wanting to protect the, 
to neighborhood school and not cause harm as they sought to expand their program more citywide. Um, so I think they were very thoughtful um, in their application. So um, they're also cognizant of the need to have a healthy neighborhood school exist for um, uh, people within the community. So I think they've been a good partner in that way and thinking about that. And not everybody thinks in that way, but that's something they've been really cognizant about um, in, uh, in putting forth this proposal. I appreciate your clarification. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the uh, We have 8.03 was also <coughs> pulled. That was a question, I believe, for uh, policy, JLJ, behavioral threat assessment. Question. Director of Student Conduct and Attendance. Uh, Thank you all for being here, and thanks for all the hard work you put in on the various drafts of this policy. Uh, we had a, a significant stakeholder engagement around this um, with some significant concerns around how this will impact students with special needs. So I just asked you to highlight that for the public so that everybody knows that it's been attended to and we're moving on forward. Thank you. So to give you the straight line communication that we've had with Disability Rights Maryland, we have incorporated the feedback from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that is based off the feedback from lessons learned from the University of Virginia and the state of Virginia in implementing the actual threat assessment, as well as Oregon, in terms of identifying students with disabilities. In that incorporation, we have incorporated the role of the IEP chair into the actual policy and also on the threat assessment team because they have general understanding of actual state law and policies related to disabilities, but the recognition of disabilities and the resources to provide those provide to those students. We have as well as addressed the issues of making sure that staff understand that threat assessment teams are called for substantive threats. Those are threats that are serious to the building and likely harm to staff, students, or anyone else in the building. We also made sure that the required implicit bias and disability awareness training language was added to have our threat assessment teams, as well as our school base, as well as our district level team. We also clarified the privacy and disclosure requirements, especially for persons with criminal records, as well as the disclosure of anything if there's a person who is involved in the assessment that is not a district employee, that they cannot relate to information that they learned. We also incorporated um, language about the screening for self-risk and self-harm, as well as the suicidal, suicidal ideations and the other duties assigned to the school-based assessment team. We also clarified the language on the delegation because often with the language, and this has come from the implementation from other districts, that often the language referred to <coughs> providing to the superintendent or the CEO to, as the decision maker, whereas if it is an Im immediate or imminent threat, there are certain things that you cannot delegate, and it was based off the size of small districts, not large districts. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, with that, we're going to, uh, I'm going to divide this up a little. We're going to vote on um, uh, items 8.01, 8.03, and 8.04. So all, all right. Motion to approve. Is there a second? second. Uh, I think it was Commissioner Lynn. So all those in favor of those three items? Virginia, six, seven, <laughs> three, absent. Okay, I just and, um, can't get the math. I'm sorry. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm going to go ahead and and, uh, and skip down if you don't mind to twelve. Oh, Commissioner Chang, we need to do you need to vote on eight hundred two. Yeah, but can I do eight hundred two with the with the, all the others if I? Oh. Yeah, I was just it's going by. Are these others are all going by consent? Okay, I wasn't sure if 802 was going yes. by consent. Okay. Yes. It, it, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I'm. I'm not sure. 12.01 was pulled for the vote. Is that correct? Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. So, yeah, you're right. Let me go back. 8.02, we need to vote on. Is that what you're saying separately? No, that can be part of consent. That can be part of the consent already. Consent, so so um, let's, let's, get, let's pull this other one out for the vote, and then we'll do all the others by consent. Does that make sense to everyone? 
Okay, so uh, is there a motion for uh, for 12.01, Care First of Maryland Incorporated? Move approval. Okay, Commissioner Hassan. Second. Commissioner Frank, all those in favor? Hassan. Chinya. Okay, and that is five. Is there any abstention? Right here. One and three absent. Okay, so now we're looking at the remainder um, that were by consent, and that was um, 8.02, um, the procurements under um, 11 from the chief academic officer, through, yeah, 14, okay. Yes, I'm, should I say that but not loud to make sure everybody here? No. Through 14, including 14.04. <laughs> um, okay, is there a motion to? Madam Chair, okay. are we including 8.05 and 8.06? Yes, I'm including the remainder that were by okay. consent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yes. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, Commissioner McFadden, second. second. Commissioner Frank, all those in favor? Virginia. McFadden. Okay. Six. Three absent. <laughs> I did pass math. <laughs> if the bear bears are still around, okay, it's a, it's a done deal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It'll be in my docu sign right after. <laughs> All right, I have uh, just a notice of, uh, uh, just a reminder that um, committee reports are in writing and they, uh, you may find them on the website for uh, this board meeting and just, yeah. Um, we have one announcement. Mm -hmm. So I, as the policy committee, we are meeting on Tuesday, December 17th um, and we will be talking at that point about policies, room, room, room. Uh, family community engagement and the equity policy update. But prior to that, we have a board forum this Thursday from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And just to clarify, this is a public board meeting where we listen to public comment, but we don't engage a lot. A public forum is a chance for the board to simply listen to every and any and all input from the community. So with this around procurement, I really encourage anyone who's interested in sourcing in MWE, in looking how we can leverage procurement to strengthen academics, um, to join us at that meeting. And that'll be this Thursday at, from 5.30 to 7. And the last thing I'll say tonight is congratulations to all national board teachers who were announced this week. Okay. So I'll, I'll finish up the upcoming meetings. You just heard about the, uh, the board forum on, on um, Tuesday, on thir Thursday. Uh, the operations committee will be meeting on Tuesday, December the 17th at 1030 here in the boardroom. Uh, we've mentioned the policy committee already. Parent and Community Advisory Board will be meeting here on Thursday, December the 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Teaching and Learning Committee meets in 2020 on January the 7th, 3.30 here in the boardroom. There will be a Youth Engagement Board Forum um, at City College High School. I will not pronounce that correctly. Deutsch Hall? Deutsch Hall. I didn't go to City, sorry. I was going to say, you need to look across right there. I did go to Eastern, which is no longer there, but sorry about that. Monday, January 13th, 2020. Um, our next uh, board meetings, uh, the executive session and public meeting will be on Tuesday, January the 14th. Um, I will say if we don't see you all, uh, either of those of you who are here in person or folks who are uh, watching us, hope that you have a very uh, safe um, and pleasant and peaceful holiday. And we'll uh, see you again in either Thursday or in 2020. Uh, the meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? I don't need a second. The meeting is adjourned.